Hi everybody, this is part two of the lecture to accompany chapter two in your textbook. Let's move on to talking about gender and communication. When we talk about gender as it relates to communication, we're not just talking about boys and girls, men and women, and the differences between them. That is obviously a part of it. But gender is a function of several different things. Gender roles, biological sex, and sexual orientation. And you have to consider all these things when you think about the ways in which we communicate with each other based on gender. So let's look at gender roles. When we talk about gender roles, what we mean is how people are supposed to act based on gender affects how we communicate. And gender roles, again, are broken down between masculine and feminine, and that's just cultural. The masculine gender role in our culture is, uh, has been traditionally of the breadwinner or the decision maker. The masculine gender role in our culture sees anything other than that as weakness. And because of that, men who really relate strongly to this masculine gender role are much less likely to take care of themselves, like go to the doctor and surprising as it may seem, men are much more likely to be a victim of crime, and I think that has to do with uh, testosterone levels. Whereas the feminine gender role in our culture is that of a nurturer or caretaker. The stereotype is that women care more about their appearance than men. And this emphasis on appearance does tend to put a tremendous pressure on women and make them more subject to things like depression. But there are other things besides masculine and feminine. There is something called androgynous, the androgynous gender role, where some people have both characteristics, and, and right now I'm not talking about physically, but I'm talking about the combination of masculine and feminine roles within the same person. So someone might assume some of those typically masculine roles, like they take more of a decision-making process in their particular household, and that could be something that a woman chooses to do. So just because something is traditionally masculine does not mean that women don't take part in that particular uh, role. So as we grow as a culture, we tend to be more androgynous as individuals. In other words, people take on both masculine and feminine gender roles within the culture. However, most cultures are still fairly well-defined in as much as gender roles are concerned. Then we have biological sex and communication. So male and female biology has an effect on how we communicate. Also, the idea of diversity within biological sex, which could be psychological, genetic, anatomical, those things can also have an impact. So some people, for instance, simply they don't feel like the sex that they are biologically, and we refer to those people as transsexual. And that obviously has an impact on the way they interact with others, because if you don't feel inside what you look like on the outside, that that can have an impact on your communication. Also, there are genetic differences. There are certain syndromes that are caused by unusual uh, combinations of chromosomes, there are anatomical differences in which some people are born with unusual combinations of sexual organs, and those kinds of things which are physical and genetic in nature can lead to gender confusion and obviously problems interacting with others and being viewed differently by others. And finally, sexual orientation and communication, and that refers to which sex we are attracted to, and it certainly does influence how we communicate and how we are perceived. Obviously, the majority of adults fall within the category of heterosexuality, in which we are physically attracted to the opposite sex. Now, in some societies, that's the only acceptable form of sexual orientation. So there's social support for that orientation that may not exist for 
other sexual orientations or exist in more limited forms, such as homosexuality, where romantic and sexual attraction is towards one's own sex. And it's interesting that historically the concept of this really wasn't an issue until the Victorian era of the 1800s. Many people in many cultures before that had close relationships, some of which were sexual, with others of their own gender, and it was considered simply part of life. But... Fortunately, recently, the battle for recognition of gay marriage has really brought this to the forefront. So the ways in which we communicate about this issue and who we are communicating with when we discuss it really apply here. Then uh, there are two other sexual orientations that a lot of people don't even either know, or if they do know, they don't talk about them. And one is bisexuality, where you have an attraction to both men and women, and asexuality, which is people who have little or no interest in sexually expressing themselves at all. So for those two groups, the communication aspects might lie in how you would explain yourself to somebody else, or how you might be perceived, or how you might choose not to even talk about it because it might be problematic within relationships. So obviously, Things are far more complicated than just girls and boys, men and women. We do have some stereotypes about what is feminine and what is masculine. We really can't apply those ideas to individuals because we are all so different. Obviously, some of those stereotypes might fit, but others do not. So let's move on to how gender specifically affects communication. And again, I'm going to make some generalizations. I am not stereotyping. I'm talking about groups as a whole rather than individuals within those groups because you may not relate to what I'm talking about at all as it relates to your gender. So each gender constitutes its own culture with rules and values. For instance, the difference between expressive talk and instrumental talk. Women, in general, are more likely to value closeness and intimacy, more likely to talk about feelings. Men are more likely to value shared activities, solving problems, reaching goals. So for women, they are more likely to use expressive talk because in their mind, communication is seen as a primary way to establish closeness with another human being. Whereas in instrumental talk, which is more the masculine trait, communication is seen as a means to an end, a means to solve problems, to accomplish tasks. So when we think of genders, we think of expressive talk as being more feminine and instrumental talk as being more masculine. Then there's the difference between more powerful and less powerful speech. Men tend to use more powerful forms of speech than women do. Men are direct, men interrupt more frequently, and they are more likely to give orders. Women, on the other hand, are much more likely than men to use qualifiers, to ask questions, to disclaim, say, I'm not sure, but I think it might be, rather than more direct speech that is more typical of masculine communication. There's a very powerful stereotype out there about who talks more. And if you ask who talks more, men or women, the obvious answer might seem to be women. But you might be surprised to find out that men and women generally use about the same number of words per day. They're just talking about different things. And it's because there's a difference between the masculine linguistic style and the feminine style of speaking. Men tend to speak in shorter sentences. Men tend to use more sentence fragments. Men refer to themselves more than women. And they also refer to quantities of things. Whereas the feminine style is to use longer sentences, more complete sentences, more qualifiers, more descriptions and descriptive words, and more references to we and they as opposed to I. So because women speak in longer sentences, you might think that we use more words, but that is not necessarily the case. So most people are very surprised to find that out. 
There's also difference in nonverbal communication between genders. So for touch, other sex touch is more common than same sex touch. In, in other words, we are more likely to touch someone um, and use that kind of nonverbal language with an opposite sex member than we are with our own same sex member. However, in same sex pairs, women will touch each other more than men do. And as far as communicating emotions to each other, women tend to express, if they express emotion, uh, they are more likely to express a positive emotion than men. Men are much more likely to express more anger than women. They may express jealousy more intensely than women. Women, on the other hand, are more likely to express sadness and depression more than anger and more than men express those things. Now, when I say express, I don't mean feel. Women and men are equally emotional. It's about the expression of emotion that is the difference between men and women. Also, women tend to use more affection behaviors than men do. So why is that? Well, it could be due to the fact that girls get more affection in childhood than men do. Affection behavior is seen as feminine, and there might be differences in hormones that promote affectionate behavior. So in the end, I'd like you to remember that there is a big difference between generalizing about groups and stereotyping based on those assumptions. So don't be guilty of assuming that an individual has a particular quality because of stereotypes. But remember that both culture and gender do play a role in our communication behaviors, but obviously it is far more complicated than we assume. This is the end of the lecture to accompany chapter two.